Good evening, everyone. Tonight we have a special guest with us again, one of our veterans that lives here in Gladstone, uh, Mr. Vernon Watson. Vernon, uh, you joined up many, many years ago. And could you tell us uh, when you joined up and where and why? I joined up in the uh, fall of 41. You want to know where? It sure. was in Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. You want to know why? The previous fall, I had served 27 or 28 days in the Army of Brandon in the first call up of the 21 year olds. Oh, well, is that right? So that gave me enough experience about what. I would look forward to in the Army if I joined the Army. I expected to be called again because I was still single. And so I decided I was going to Winnipeg and I would endeavor to get into air crews. Now, why was it, uh, uh, had you always wanted to fly? Oh, yes, I, I definitely had wanted to fly, but the minimum flying lessons would have cost me a thousand dollars and a thousand dollars in those days. You could have bought a car. <laughs> <laughs> could have got a car and uh, probably a few girlfriends to, well, to go sure. along with it. Mm -hmm. So that was your reason that you joined yeah. Air, chose Air Force? Uh, not all, totally. I felt that in the Air Force, if you come back, you'd come back in one piece. I dreaded the thought of coming back with a, possibly one leg or even both legs gone. Mm -hmm. So I felt that if I come back at all from the Air Force, I would likely come back in one piece. Well, that's very interesting, Vernon, because I've never heard anyone say that before, but it's an interesting concept. And you never thought about that some of those airmen got badly burned, eh? Oh, I found that out later. <laughs> yes. Yes. Some very badly. Yes. So, uh, were you stationed at Winnipeg, or no? Did they I had uh, joined up as uh, well. It's Latin, I guess. It's ab initio, a pilot or observer. Uh, I see. So they sent me to Brandon at the start for my basic left and right, and all my drill. And it was while I was in Brandon that uh, the Japanese attacked at Pearl Harbor. Yes, that was in December of 41. Uh, yes. And being that our uh, group that had went to there was composed of approximately 20% Americans that had felt that they should be in the war and they had come across the line and, and enlisted in Canada. but. When Pearl Harbor took place, it made them feel that they should be really back home and trying to endeavor to help the war effort, the American war effort. So one by one, we started to lose uh, some of the Americans. Oh, did you? That's uh, understandable, though, isn't it? Well, they felt that uh, possibly the training would be a little quicker. and. In the States. They just didn't know how quick we could be here, did they? <laughs> a lot of them, they definitely did stay. And even when I was in uh, taking my service flying training, uh, we had uh, quite a proportion of Americans. Mm -hmm. But if anything happened that they were washed out or anything, they quickly got across the line and went back home. And then would they have been accepted in the yeah, United right States Air Force? Yeah, they into America. They would. Yeah. And do you think they would have made it? Oh, yes. I think uh, we had a lot of people that were plenty good enough in the flying part of it, but uh, everybody wanted to be a fighter pilot. You couldn't all be a fighter pilot. Yeah. It was navigators and observers, wireless operators, etc. So uh, if you couldn't get to, into uh, a pilot's course, well, quite often they would feel that they could do better at home. I see. So, uh, 
So how long were you in Brandon then? I was in Brandon uh, until late in January, I think, of 42. And because of so many Americans going back home, I think it was uh, the policy that they were trying to keep them in Canada if possible. So we were sent to Paulson in, in a holding unit, which is uh, seven or eight miles east of Dauphin. And the only way you can get out of there to uh, go into a well it was to uh, take the train from Dauphin. And the service police, of course, checked it out. And, uh, it's the, the, it's waiting for you. Yeah. And Dauphin was so much isolated, especially in the wintertime in 42, because at that time uh, they had started to restrict uh, people on uh, passengers. You could only go so far, even with a uh, uh, Greyhound bus. Of course, it wasn't Greyhound at that time, but you could only get a, a ticket for 50 miles. Mm -hmm. It wasn't Greyhound at that time? Or, no. or that would be a. Uh, uh, it was MacArthur's, I think. Oh, uh, I see. From, uh, I think their head office was in Brandon at the time. I see. Mm -hmm. There now, were a lot, large trucking outfit. Oh, yes. Now, uh, my uh, uh, understanding is that Dauphin was a very complex, is that the right word, uh, airport or station at that time? Like there was more than one actual airport there, wasn't there? Yeah, there was the Southport, it was four, about four miles south of Dauphin, and it was an SFDS service line during the school. And, and uh, what, was it just was the pilots that were there? Yeah, pilots on their training at, at uh, Southport. Mm -hmm. And at uh, Paulson, it was a bomb and gunnery school. And then was there not another one as well? Well, like, we were stationed on, on Paulson. At, uh, I thought there were three. It was not that I know of, but well, at that time know. it was part of the station was called a holding unit, mm -hmm. waiting for, well everybody was trying to get in the Air Force and they couldn't take them all at the same time. So uh, they were afraid to lose a lot of good prospects because in the uh, uh, pilot course and uh, air observer course at that time, and it still hadn't been split up yet, uh, they wanted people preferably with uh, university education or at least their grade 12. Yes. All I had really was my grade 11. Mm -hmm. So I was not very happy. That, that, would, uh, that was equivalent to being, like you could graduate at that time with oh, your yes, grade 11. Oh yes, I did. I, I had taken uh, my grade 9 and 10 by correspondence and I had went to Winnipeg and taken my grade 11. And didn't the Air Force, or perhaps you're not familiar with this, my, uh, I knew a fellow who was in the Air Force, and he had his grade 8, and they upgraded him to the equivalent of his grade 11. Now, do you know anything about that? Yeah. You do? They had to, because they weren't getting enough. Uh, oh. They were taking everybody from grade 12, uh, everybody that was graduating, mm -hmm. if they were at least 17 and a half years old. At the earlier, they, was, uh, they had to be 18, but uh, they felt that at 17 and a half, before they'd ever get overseas, they'd have taken uh, six months at these trainings, so they would be the 18 by the time. Oh were. yes, that was one of the policies, I guess. Uh, Is that right? 17 and a half. Yeah, yeah. And they took them in. Yeah. Well, I, I wasn't aware of that. So, um, uh, now what was your training then at Dauphin? What were you trained I, to do? I wasn't. I was just in a holding. Uh, oh, you were just in a holding. Uh, and so, I was only there for, uh, I think it was uh, a little over a month. Oh, I see. And then um, there was uh, openings at uh, McDonald's, Carberry, Rivers, for people to take their tarmac duty. This what, was what's to tarmac duty? This was to familiarize yourself so that you would know when you started with your uh, initial training that you would at least know what a propeller was. Uh, uh, know the different parts of the plane. Yeah. 
and you were Joe Boys for the mechanics and the business. And would they t uh, teach you about the differences in the airplanes? Not really, but you just learn it as you, you go. Uh, and of course, uh, being new, and the people that were servicing the planes at the time, that well, so they've been in the Air Force for a year or more. Uh, there was lots of tricks played on us. Uh, one that I, uh, to this day, I'm not even sure. I was asked to go for a five-gallon pail of crop wash. And I kept telling them that you couldn't put, put slipstream in a, in a five-gallon pail. What is slipstream? <laughs> slipstream from your propellers when you walk behind the plane and it's, the propeller's going, it yeah. blows your hat off. Yeah. And, I said that you couldn't put this, uh, the slipstream because it asked me for crop wash. Mm -hmm. I felt that that was uh, the equivalent of uh, slang for uh, slipstream. So it was uh, comical at times, but yet you were the the go-to. Yeah, I can I can see. Yeah. <laughs> so we were there for the guard or tarmac duty, as they called it, for till the end of March. And then we were sent to uh, initial training school at Saskatoon. I see. Now, uh, uh, Vernon, you mentioned about Carberry. It would only be RAF fellows at Carberry, was it not? Yeah, yeah. This is what I thought. Uh, Rivers was, uh, I guess, started as RAF, and then it was more or less Canadianized after. Oh, was it? I, I thought it was always RCAN. Uh, it's possibly the, the higher ups were still RAF, but uh, as you get uh, trainees from Canada graduating, you uh, mm -hmm. get more and more. Mm -hmm. So how long were you at Saskatoon then? I was in ITS until I graduated in uh, the end of May of 42. It would be about uh, two months of initial training. And if you could graduate from there, you were ready to go to uh, either uh, Air Observer School to take your uh, observer's course or uh, you go to uh, elementary for your pilot's training course. So you went to take your... Well, I, they asked, my navigation was good enough, they asked me to go as an observer, but I said I preferred to go as a pilot in the training course, and if I didn't make it, I would still go on the observer course. But all during the time that we were in IDS, in that two months, there was lots of rumors that there was going to be a very big uh, change in the, uh, Air Command in the training, because up until that time, uh, nearly all the bombers were, were twin engine, either light twins or heavy twins, and they were had on drawing boards, of course, they had the four engines, Sterling, Halifax, and Lancasters. And they felt that uh, there was, uh, it would be changed from a four or five man crew to a seven man crew. And uh, for a while they were considering that with all uh, four engine bombers were going to be a two man pilot and an observer, and of course the wireless operator and the hail gunners. They were finding out that uh, the observer was overworked uh, because it went from uh, approximately 140 mile an hour planes to 180 mile an hour and it entails quite a bit of an increase in your navigation. So they were considering... What's, pardon me, what speed do you break the sound barrier? Pardon? What speed do you break the sound barrier? You Around 700 miles an hour. Is it well, Six, seven years. Well, that's something. a lot faster than what you fellows are going at. Oh, yes. Uh, we on our training planes, so most of them are just around 100 or 110 mm -hmm. mile an hour. So we were worried for fear that uh, there was going to be a big uh, split in the, and they had brought in the, the, up until that time it was an observer, he did both the navigation and the bombing. They split uh, it, uh, it up until there was uh, what they called was the navigation course and of course you were called navigators after that. So and basically then 
there isn't that much difference between an observer and a navigator? Is this what no, you're saying? No, not really. Is that right? Uh, the observer, they were took the navigation course. Uh, they had to pass the navigation part before they did any of the bombing part, before they got their wings out. Well, that sort of makes sense. But when they split it up and the navigators just took navigation, and then they had introduced the, what they called as the air bomber course. And it was concentrated more on the bombing, but you took some uh, uh, navigation. It was practically the same course that the old observers took. Exactly. But you didn't need to have near that education that the observer course had taken. So it's a lot of chaps were getting in with it, I mean, possibly grade 10 or so. Oh, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So, um, uh, from Saskatoon, when I got, I went to Prince Albert for my single engine flying, mm -hmm. and I graduated from there. And as single engine flying, you mean you yourself were flying the plane? You were the yes. pilot? Yeah. Well, I had approximately uh, as much dual as I did flying once once I soloed. Uh, what do you mean dual? Dual is when you have your instructor flying with you. Oh, I see. Okay, that makes sense. And uh, after you were able to solo, well, then you had approximately uh, half your flying time was uh, solo and half the time he was teaching you something new. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed it because I enjoyed uh, the loop loops and uh, oh, you did? slow rolls and uh, <laughs> stall turns. I really enjoyed that. Is that right? And I was very disappointed that when they decided that they were going to send all the graduates from there to uh, twin engine uh, flying schools and you were going to be, end up as a bomber pilot. Did, did you have apprehension when you first started doing these loop the loops and so on? Oh, yes. yes you uh, did? Yeah, yeah. Before you could even fly uh, a solo, they made you uh, recover from a spin. You deliberately put the plane into a spin and there was a spiral and you had to give it the opposite rudder and uh, stick forward and a few other little things to straighten it out. And the very first time I tried it on my own, I hesitated too long and I went into a reverse spin, spin the other way. So, uh, Would that not uh, do something to uh, your the, plane? The, the, the instructor in front <laughs> was sitting in the, it was dual, he was sitting in a seat ahead of me. And his head was <laughs> like this when I... That would really scare you, I bet, did it? Pardon? Did it scare you? Well, or I did guess... did you realize you, what was happening? Well, I realized that possibly I would go from one to the other and all the way to the ground if I didn't smarten up. <laughs> so from there we... Uh, there was... Uh, they even gave us a choice. There was tickets and a hat to see where you went from from Prince Albert after you graduated. And I drew a ticket and I got two weeks leave. But uh, there was five of the shops were, uh, five of the tickets were for, for uh, Dauphin and the rest of them were for Clare's Home, Alberta. So I fished around and I found somebody that had a Dauphin ticket that would take that would prefer to have a, a, a two-week leave ticket, so I was able to come to Dauphin. Uh, when you were Dauphin, uh, I'm assuming there were uh, uh, WDs there then, women's division, were there? Just any? starting. Uh, because they that? started up in 1941. Yeah. And the first group went over in 42. So, and a lot of the ones that I have spoken with or heard from have indicated they were stationed at Dauphin, and that's women from the states and uh, all over. Yeah. It wasn't the preferable uh, posting that uh, a lot of them would, none of them would have wanted. No, I wouldn't think so, not with our cold weather special. Well, uh, you come from a warmer climate. It was uh, a little harder to uh, get to Winnipeg if you wanted a uh, long weekend in Winnipeg or whatever. Dauphin was so crowded 
was it? With uh, uh, servicemen from both stations that uh, you couldn't hardly get into uh, a theater. They only had the one theater and often, I think, at that time. That right. But uh, quite a few shows we had on the station. So, and uh, you were saying that there were some women there and there would be some, uh, there would be women in the Air Force too as you progressed in your career. How did you find uh, it was with them, like did the men uh, in the Air Force accept them the way they should or, I, or was I there a bit of resentment? I think they then? would. Uh, at the start, of course, we thought that they were all clerks and uh, cooks and that. And later on, when they started uh, refueling our planes for, for us, uh, we were a little apprehensive that they knew what uh, 10 gallons was or whatever. <laughs> you have little faith. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, as my understanding is, some of them that were serving overseas replaced the, uh, the equivalent of two men to go to the front. Okay. Now, uh, do you think that was possible? Well, I don't think in very many cases it would be. Is that right? Yeah. And not, like, that's not just uh, Air Force women, that's yeah. uh, Army too. Mm -hmm. But all the time that we were training up until this time, uh, we were apprehensive about this year a new bomb, air bombers course and they were needing people for the, that. So you had to keep your nose clean. And uh, why were you apprehensive about the air bombers course? Because I still wanted to be a pilot. So uh, I had uh, did most of my training on the twin engine. I hadn't done the, the formation flying training yet. and. One night, uh, just after lights out, uh, a chap came tearing in and read off uh, seven names. Uh, five of them were the last five on the alphabet. Two others were chaps that had... Uh, so there go the W's. Pardon? So there goes the W's. That's right. I learned that after I ever joined up again, I'd stroke that W off because <laughs> You got Joe for everything. Is that right? They ever took the last couple of names off the alphabet. I wonder they didn't go for the first of the alphabet. Well, that's the odd time they did, but it was always a nice thing that they probably they want you to drive a car, or <laughs> take the CEO on a drive. Anyway, there was uh, we went to the, the washroom. We were in H huts at the time because the rest of the barracks was in darkness. So this chap, he rounded us up and took us in and said that he had had uh, been CB'd. I don't know what he had done, but he was confined to barracks and he had to polish the floor in the flight commander's office. And on the desk he said that there was a name, seven names, two uh, besides the last five in the alphabet. And uh, we were all to get a progress check, flying, and five were to get the, and there was a stroke. So the f seven of us decided that the two that hadn't been, well, one of them had uh, the taxi is playing after dark and tripped the wing of, of another plane, and one had done something wrong with us. Uh, running out of gas or something. Both serious offenses really, aren't they? Yes. So the five of us, we were deciding who was going to be the two lucky ones that were going to be able to pass the test. And being that there was two of them that were Americans, one was Schreiner and the other one was Tennyson, and we figured that uh, they would be the ones that would automatically so we did our test and of course I was possibly on a belligerent mood because I knew that with the W you were going to be the one that the ones that would get damned. So as it turned out that was the true, except 
but the two Americans didn't automatically go. One went on and one was washed out, as they called it. So uh, one of the other chaps went to take the course. So after that, I was classified as an air bomber. I'd lost my pilot training. How did you feel about that? I was very disappointed. They sent us to, to uh, Trenton, Ontario. We were to be reclassified. So I, at the start, I didn't care whether I was an air crew or not. After going that long, not much of my training. Oh, but by the time I thought about it, I decided that, well, if I was going to be an air bomber, I'd try to do the very best that there was. So then I sent me back to uh, Dayfo, Saskatchewan for my bombing training. Now, uh, you have your wings there. Now, did you, uh, did you receive your wings for your, as you took your training? Like when do you receive your wings in the Air Force? When you graduated and got to, to the very end of your training. I see. I was still in LAC at the time, a leading aircraftsman. So I took my bombing training there and I took my air observer training in Winnipeg at the AOS. Graduated there in May of... Whereabouts was the, uh, the airport for training in Winnipeg? Uh, Where was it located? We were on Stevenson Field. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, I guess there was about three different schools or whatever you would well, call it. All used the Stevenson Field. There was a uh, number, I don't know, I think it was number eight, repair depot. Mm -hmm. And uh, number three, wireless training school was, had uh, planes there that they took. And I think the the ground school for the wireless operators was over in Charlesburg or someplace, some big uh, school or something that would be, that uh, they'd be, what's the word? Have room to accommodate? Well, when you lose a, somebody, the government tends to take your... Uh, well, basically, it confiscates. Yeah, confiscates the word. And uh, so that's where I got my wings. There was a, May of 1943. Pretty proud moment, wasn't it? It was. Uh, but being that I'd won the trophy at, at DAFO for my bombing, they sent me on a special course then to uh, uh, Jarvis, Ontario. We were trying to bomb moving targets. We used Lake Erie with a high speed boat towing a target. And we were trying to. Do what were you using? Like you wouldn't be using live bombs, so would you? What no, would we you used these here small. In uh, at night, they would uh, a puff of uh, flame, mm -hmm. and what most of the ones in the daytime were a small what they call a smoke bomb. I think there were about eleven or fourteen pounds or something, mm -hmm. but uh, there'd be a puff of smoke, and of course, the people that were. Uh, assessing your your score, they were in uh, places that are maybe be half a mile away and there would be two so that they could get across a with, with, a, with a, to see how far you were from the, the target. I see. You know, where the line intersected. It wasn't the, the other person in the plane that At, uh, when evaluated. I, we, when I were doing the Moving target, mm -hmm. it had to be a, a picture a camera it would take. Oh, is that right? Yeah, you had to have two people go with you. Well, you would alternate. There would be about twelve bombs that we'd have, and, and you'd drop there your twelve, and, and somebody else would be doing the, the work in the camera, and then you would have to take the, your turn of running the camera while. Well. Now, um, speaking of this. The photography was a big thing in the Air Force, wasn't oh, it? Oh, it definitely was. But the reason uh, we understood afterwards about the moving target was uh, we were going to try and bring a, a course in that, that would uh, uh, possibly 
I don't know how you really explain it, but the, the year before, in February of '42, mm -hmm. the German pocket battleships and heavy cruisers that were in Brest, in the harbor at Brest, France, mm -hmm. snuck up the channel all the way past and sort of rubbed the nose in uh, the people in uh, Britain that they could fly uh, fly if they wanted to, but they weren't going to be able to see them because they took the very worst weather that there was on the, the channel at the time. Mm -hmm. And the, the three, the two heavy cruisers and the one battle, the battle cruiser, pocket battleship I guess it was, uh, they were going to, because uh, there had been uh, well, like I said, there were Canadians, of course, RCF fighters that had been across to France, flying at low level because of clouds and everything, this fog and everything that was down put into the, the water. Inst instrument. And they, they had reported that there was a terrible lot of uh, fishing boats out in that channel, and they couldn't understand why they were going so fast. It was white plumes of foam going. Well, of course, it was the destroyers and that were accompanying these battleships. But they said that the pilot didn't know that these were, were destroyers and that. They thought they were fishing boats. Oh. So that was going to be the, the, the summation of uh, your training on moving, bombing moving targets, training them for bombing moving targets. So after that, I graduated and went to uh, England. When I was in England, they were still thinking about this course that they wanted to, about uh, moving targets. So they sent me to a course in uh, the Isle of Man uh, to take ship recognition. And there was little model sh ships, battleships and that, and for the different nationalities. And they were be at the end of a hall, maybe 40, 50 feet away, and you had a, a pair of field glasses and you were looking at them and you had to try to identify where they, well they were really easy to identify the, the Italians and the Japanese because they had so many things sticking out here and there all over but it was a little harder to tell them. The German ships. So we were there for three weeks taking that course and then they sent us to uh, the Orkney Islands to fly over the actual fleet. So we were there for um, maybe two weeks or three weeks. You'd have to have awfully good eyesight. Oh, yes. I didn't know I was wearing glasses in those days. Oh, I guess not. <laughs> and would that, that would be the same uh, thing too, wouldn't it, for, uh, uh, as a pilot, like when you're taking your pilot's training, you'd have to have awfully good eyesight, wouldn't you? Oh, well, that's, that's for sure. Because a lot would depend on it. So from there I went to uh, ODU, we were to crew, trying to crew up. And there was a whole lot of people. It was late in the fall. And it was raining. Everybody had their uh, trench coat on or their red coat on. So you couldn't tell who, who was pilots, who was air bombers, and who was navigators. So I recognized a chap that I knew that I trained with someplace around there. Is that there, right? But I didn't know what he was until no. the next day when they were. Uh, we were in a hall and we were going to try and make a cruise and I recognized this. he was a pilot and I remembered that I had been at his graduation at Dauphin. Is he, that was, he was in two courses ahead of me at Dauphin and he had graduated. Now what would your status be at this time? Like were you a flying officer? Or no, what I was a pilot officer. You were then. a pilot officer. When I graduated from Winnipeg in May of 43. I, Got my, yeah. You became a pilot officer, so yeah, you, got my, so you were uh, making pretty good money then. Oh yes, yes, uh, getting all of uh, six and a quarter a day. Mm, that's a lot better than the, oh, the guys yes, in the infantry. Oh yes, ninety cents. That was better than the ninety cents. Yes, of course. right. <laughs> Although I had been uh, as an LAC leading aircraftsman. I had been getting two and a quarter a day. Well, that's pretty good too. Yeah, it was 75 cents of that was flying pay. Mm -hmm. 
and I got it every day, even at the days I didn't fly. And it was a dollar and a half was for my uh, um, rank, I guess you would call it. Mm -hmm. Now, did and you had to send so much of that money home too, did you? Not then. You didn't. Uh, it was after when I got ready to go overseas. I had to send. Oh, I see. Up until then, you could send. You, they were encouraged you to buy a can of savings bonds. These bonds that were, I think you paid four, four dollars for them, and if you kept them for seven years or something, you'd get five dollars or something. They encouraged us to save to half, of, half of our pay. A lot of us. Well, when you're earning that kind of money, Vernon, you must have had the the admiration of a lot of English ladies. Oh, that's for sure, because uh, of course our pay was so much better than the RRF pay. That's it what I It wasn't near the, what the American pay was. So. <laughs> no. so what was your first impression of Britain when you got over there? I think that I was disappointed. Because by this time, the novelty had worn off of entertaining the colonies. And we were the colonies. Canada was a colony. I see. So I think the, they begin to resent us. You mean the British people? What, Do you? Uh, well, not as much as the, as the English people, as the service people. Oh. Oh, is that right? Uh, when your pay is almost twice what their pay is. Yeah, I can uh, see how that and, would uh, be a little this jealousy. This girl would like to go uh, and have a, more than just uh, fish and chips. Uh, right. Uh, possibly you might get a, a real egg or whatever. Or so was what they were only their egg rations were something like one one or two a month, I believe, weren't they? Uh, something like that. We mostly it was a powdered egg. It wasn't until we got to the squadron that we got uh, two eggs uh, before each trip that we made. Oh, is that right? Now, did you say you went over in '43? Yeah. By the time I finished uh, my old, uh, those courses that I'd taken, and um, I finished my OTU on uh, twin engines, heavy twin engine bombers, that had been uh, frontline bombers in the first couple of years of the war, then we were lucky enough that we were posted to a special duty squadron. Now, um, what about billeting over there? Were you in barracks? Or were you in billets? Uh, most of the time, we were in uh, what they call Nissen huts. That was uh, built with lumber or brick at both ends, and they were curved like these machine sheds that uh, a lot of the farmers have. And you would have a little potbelly stove in the middle of it. And they would hold from seven to fourteen. Most of the crews were seven-man crews, so uh, of course, if you wanted a billet there, uh, even whether, regardless of uh, the rank, some of the seven-man crew would be officers, and some of them would be NCOs. We prefer to uh, billet together. So your whole crew would be billeting in the same place. Yeah. See, uh, my understanding with the. Air Force women, and I think maybe the Army women too, but I may have forgotten there. They weren't, uh, uh, like there were no barracks for them. Yours was sort of like a barracks. They billeted out privately, like they rented a suite or whatever, oh, yeah. privately. They didn't have the facilities of having their own barracks. Yeah. So that was different for... Uh, but in the UCR and Nizam, that's as they call them. There was no nothing you had to go approximately a half a mile to the bathroom or uh, well, that would to be get, handy. Uh, get shaved. Mm -hmm. So you'd have to get up early in the morning. Yes. 
but when we were posted to the special duty squadron, we really didn't know what we were going to do, what job we were going to be doing. And when we got there late at night, we had phoned and for transport, and we thought we were going to be on the road all night. When we got to the gate, the, they didn't know any of us. And uh, it was when we first ran into really tough security. So we knew that it was pretty hush-hush what we were going to be expected to do. And of course, the next morning I was up early, as I'm always up early. My wife can verify that. Uh, I sat down beside some other chaps for my breakfast. And I asked them something about what we were doing. And they wanted to know if I was in a crew, and if, when I had arrived. And, uh, they said that uh, it would be in time I would find out what we were going to be doing. So, so it was sort of hush-hush? It was sort of hush-hush, but of course in a couple of days we found out that we were going to be working with the underground. Oh, is that right? And that was why the security? Yeah. And most of our briefings were done by the French. And that's when I really regretted that I had never taken French in school. Is that right? And so it was the French underground you were working with? Yeah, mostly. We did make one trip to uh, Norway. But it was mostly with the, the French underground. Now, when, uh, you, when you were flying over, was it uh, always at night that you were flying over at this time? I did my 41 trips, I did it at, at night. They called it at night, and I was very fortunate because I did my first trip on the last day of March, and I was able to finish my tour by the 9th or 10th of August. Now, uh, pardon me for interrupting. No, go ahead. Uh, they called at night, of course, but you took off in daylight at that time of the year, mm -hmm. and you landed in daylight. Makes sense. So all those chaps that come back so tired from Bomber Command in the middle of the winter time and uh, wearing these big heavy uh, flying suits and stuff, lots of it was accidents after they got back home. What do you mean but accidents after they got back home? Well, landing the plane, being overtired. Oh, they were overtired. Uh, I see. Wearing these heavy. Uh, yeah, it'd be pretty cumbersome. Yeah. Whereas I was did my tour in the, the summer months, and I did. It was at low level. We did our low level. We flew over. We tried to get under radar. We flew at 500 feet, and to find these reception places. Our reception would be uh, the underground, mm -hmm. and we had to map read, find our way there, and drop You'd our have load. To be awfully good at the navigating, wouldn't you? Well, it was actually good map reading. We only operated in the moon period of the month, oh. so it was only from 10 to 14 days that you could work. Uh, sometimes. The moon wouldn't come up in time. You know how the moon, sometimes when you get up in the morning, the moon is, is up here someplace. It had got up too late after midnight or whatever. So you lost those hours that you could have been flying. So we would find these fields, farmer's field. Mm -hmm. And there would be a reception committee there and there would be three lights in a row, flashlights, and at the tail end there would be an extra one that would flash your Morse code and your letter. And if we happened to be working in Wales and very often with the British intelligence, they insisted that we have both a letter and a, a, a figure in Morse code. So you'd have to spend quite a bit of time uh, learning Morris code, wouldn't you? Oh, if, yes. If you had to do it both ways? Yeah. And... And how they, would they use their 
their flashlights to keep uh, them the lights from being seen on ground. They could didn't. Like they, did they put something around them? I think it's possibly that. that I think there were uh, flashlights inside a pail. Yeah. That would make sense. And you'd only be, if you flew over, you'd be able you'd to see, see it. it. If you wouldn't, uh, if you're on the ground, you wouldn't. So, what were they signaling you? What information? What was it that, that, they, that they were there for us? We would, before we took off, we'd be interrogated and given a briefing about where we were to go, and the signal that would be shown for us. So we weren't to drop it on anything else but our own signal. The, uh, you, you, you never had to land, no, or did you? No, no. Uh, the material that we were taking, we carried in the bomb bay just as though it was a bomb. And these containers were about the size of your uh, electric water heater, mm -hmm. only about uh, six or seven feet long. And they were made of metal, and on the end there would be padding for the, to fall on the ground, and on the other end there would be a par parachute folded up. And these parachutes were almost about approximately two-thirds the size of one that you, that an airman wore. And, and it would contain pertinent information, would it, or supplies? These hot water tanks, as we call yeah. them. No, they were stem guns, uh, ammunition, dynamite, uh, oh. anything. Uh, besides that, we carried parcels inside the plane. Uh, our original mid-upper gunner was uh, given a course in uh, parachute training and uh, the parcels would be pushed out at the, at the same time as I would push the tit for the, to, to get the containers that were in the bomb bay. When we flew over the, the end of the, the three lights in a row, it was the one that was doing the signaling. That was when, when you were over top of that. You started the thing and it usually was uh, Load was unloaded by the time you got to the far end of the three lights. That, that was a very interesting time in your life, I'm sure. Oh, we were really excited about it because we were finding out what some of these parcels that we were containing, some of these parcels, and all there was several that were folded up bicycles, and they weren't really used as a bicycle except that uh, you pedaled away there, but you didn't go anywhere, but it was running uh, a belt and a generator that was producing enough electric current that they could send signals to England that uh, we had been there with our load and uh, uh, other things that we knew that we had taken was uh, they didn't call it instant coffee, they called it condensed coffee. I think it's sort of like you use condensed milk and you use condensed yeah. coffee. Mm -hmm. It was a sort of a liquid in a, in a jar. We even took army oh, boots. Oh, a liquid? Yeah, it was a liquid in a jar. You used a teaspoon of liquid. Uh, I think maybe our instant coffee is much better. Mm -hmm. uh, also, we had at times uh, when uh, D-Day came along, we knew that we were taking uh, quite a load of uh, American money at times because it could be used for blackmailing and... Uh, oh, on the black market. Uh, on the black market. So it was really exciting work. Oh, I would think so. So did it make you feel then that you were glad you weren't a, a pilot? Yes, yes because the pilot I had uh, gave me off lots of opportunities to fly the plane. Is that right? Uh, we used to, being that it was concentrated in 10 or 14 days in a month, it was the only time that we really worked. That was the time we were given at least five days leave every month. 
times. But because I had trained on Dauphin as far as I had with the pilot's course, and being that my pilot was, had been two courses ahead of me, uh, we used to have to do uh, two nights on and one off. And the second night, you hadn't had very little sleep after the first one because of interrogation and everything, and then you had to get uh, ready for the next night. And didn't give you much time to wind down? No. Uh, so once we dropped the load on the second night, usually I took over and flew the plane home, and, and uh, the pilot would try to get a little bit of shut-eye in the rest position in the plane, the two benches in the plane between the spars. What's a spar in a plane? The spar is the two main, th from wingtip to wingtip, and the plane is built around it, but you've got a front spar where the motors are fastened to, and this, there's about eight feet apart, and there was these padded benches that they, in the inside of the plane, where you could take four people sitting side by side, or you could have somebody that could be laying down. And my pilot used to get quite a bit of shell eye when I would take the plane home. He'd be very relieved to have a navigator who could well, take over the that, controls. And, he was uh, lucky. And not only that, but he'd tell me different times about making some comment to somebody that, well, his pilot, or his air bomber had taken the plane home last night. I said, you wouldn't let your air bomber fly the plane, would you? He says, well, I think he's as good a pilot as I am. Well, that was a good compliment. Yeah. So as an air bomber then, did you ever drop bombs? No. Or is being an air bo bomber just that what was, you that did? Was, that was what I was trained for. I was trained to drop bombs. Oh, but I that, see. I didn't go on bomber command. No. But I used the same thing that, uh, a bo uh, that I could have dropped bombs because I was dropping these CO canisters. I yeah. Now, uh, a tour was how many flights? Uh, well, there's a normal tour on Bomber Command at that time was 30 trips. But because of our work, especially in the winter time, they were making 14 and 15 hour trips to Poland. And they didn't feel that if they were doing it was 14 or 15 hour trips to Poland, and we were making f seven and eight hour trips in the summertime, that it wasn't fair that they would have to play, do 30 trips and all the way to Poland. Mm -hmm. So on our squadron, it was changed that you had to do 250 operating hours. Which would be roughly how many flights? And that it would be about 30 flights uh, of eight hours, or quite a difference in if the trips were 14 and 15 hours. And the only way they could make these longer trips was they had to uh, put 300-gallon tanks in the bomb bay. And so that reduced the amount of supplies that they could also take. It would, because that's quite a lot because, of weight. Because uh, we used an average, pretty close average of of 1,800 gallons for a of, flight of, of petrol for a flight. I hate to think what you'd have to pay at uh, the welcome stop out here for uh, 1,882 gallons of. Uh, <laughs> well, and anyway, it would be well over 7,000 <laughs> liters. I know that. <laughs> well, you know when uh, uh, I always compare the prices of fuel to when we took over, and the only product that I can recall, and that was 73, uh, the price of heating oil was 22.7 cents a gallon. Yeah. <laughs> so not, not very long ago, my son was talking about when he came home in, in 72, he had been working in the north for a few years, and he said his first fuel bill was 24 cents a gallon first for diesel fuel for dad's tractor. <laughs> Yeah, that's about what it would be yeah. at that time, because I think the heating oil was a little bit less. Than. So prices have changed. Now we can't get a liter. <laughs> no. So, uh, so how many tours did you make throughout your stay in England? I just only made one tour. Oh, you did? I did 41 trips 
at, at, at night, and I did two volunteer daylight trips after I, my tour was supposed to be finished. When my tour was finished, my pilot and navigator were posted to uh, uh, service school in England, and I waited for a posting. It was supposed to be what they'd call useful employment. And uh, while I was waiting there, I volunteered when they needed an extra air bomber, and I did two daylight trips. This time, of course, the daylight trip was, was n n really nothing extra, really, because uh, by this time, most of the area where we were going was very lightly defended. We were going into the French part of the Alps, mm -hmm. and of course, D-Day was already in progress, and so uh, and once you would cross the, the lines, I guess you would call it, where the, the fighting was, well, it was nothing then to, it was more of an enjoyable flying Sunday trip. Uh, you take your car out Sunday and go for a car ride. Well, well you, you had quite an experience, Vernon. What I have wondered about, Vernon, is um, what was the stress level when you were taking off as a crew? Did you feel a lot of stress, or were you relaxed oh, and calm? Oh, oh d definitely, because uh, there were so many things that could go wrong. Uh, a plane could have an engine cut as you're taken off. Uh, even with all four engines running perfectly, uh, you get uh, torque, as they call it, wanting to go to one side of the runway. It's always the same side, and I can't even remember now which side it is. You have to correct it without overcorrecting. Uh, you're always apprehensive about whether uh, the three hydraulic controls, whether you are lifting the undercarriage or Opening the bomb doors was a, a bad one because you automatically crashed at the end of the runway. Oh, did you? With the extra drag, with the mm -hmm. open the bomb doors. Uh, wasn't such a disaster to uh, move the lever for the, uh, oh, can't think of the, the word. You mean the stick? The, fl the extra flap that you put on oh, yeah. to take off. Mm -hmm. So there was lots of stress then when you were taking off. That's definitely, yeah. And uh, then did it ease off once you got your uh, altitude? Once you, well, once you got to 500 feet even, uh, you could breathe easy, easier. A plane could have an engine cut it when you were at 500 feet and it would still be pretty serious, but at least uh, you had something to work with. Now, what kind of a plane were you using to make these flights in conjunction with the French underground. What kind of a plane were you using? We were using modified Halifax 5s, uh, although uh, I think a good portion of them might have been Halifax 2s. Uh, they were modified in the sense that we didn't have a mid-upper turret mm -hmm. because we had that uh, jump hole in the bottom of the plane right about where the, straight underneath where the, the turret would have been mm -hmm. and would, if you'd had the mid-upper turret, it would weaken the plane enough because this hole where these big packages went out and also where your Joes went out. Mm -hmm. uh, so this this would be a smaller plane than your the Lancasters were, would it? Um, not really. Uh, Lancaster was a little later and a little better than the Halifax, but the only thing with the Lancaster was built specially, and you didn't do much else but drop bombs as bomber. Whereas uh, Halifax, a lot of them were used for towing gliders, parachute training, and it was a sturdier plane, but because the Lancaster had um, Oh, not sure what the word should be. Uh, 
it was getting uh, publicity, maybe you'd call it. Uh, so therefore, and it was a, an easier plane, I guess, to fly. Mm -hmm. It got preference about having the increase in your horsepower of your motors, whereas the Halifax twos and fives uh, operated with uh, uh, double X, as a Roman numerals for, for 20 mm -hmm. or 22. Whereas uh, Lancaster got 24s, and of course uh, the Packard Merlin that was produced in the States that were being sent over, Lancaster's got all those, and they were in uh, 14 to 1500 horsepower range. Now, you, uh, you were always using uh, Canadian planes, weren't you? Overseas? Yeah. No. Oh, you weren't? No, they were all built in Britain. Oh, I see. Yeah. I didn't realize that. Uh, we were actually getting new, brand new ones. Uh, after our crew had done about, about 10 or 12 trips, and we were our senior crew in our flight, those that had been before us had either graduated or got the chop, uh, we were given, I don't know who you'd call it, special privileges, but we had uh, we showed for, like, if there was a new plane delivered to our squadron, we had to fly the what they called uh, acceptance t t test. Mm -hmm. We would fly that, and then, and then you signed. And we often wondered what we we really signed when we signed that we had accepted it, whether we accepted it <laughs> uh, off the the assembly line and, and uh, were responsible for any shortcomings that uh, might be in it or whether if uh, something happened or whether uh, George would uh, insist that he get his money back when... Uh, well, as long as they weren't like our present day sea kings, <laughs> you weren't too bad. No. <laughs> the, um, see, I didn't realize that it was British planes you were using. And yeah. was all our Air Force using British planes? Yeah. They were? Uh, I shouldn't say that all together. Uh, most of Bomber Command, of course, were using Lancaster or Halifaxes. But uh, a lot of the planes that in the early part of the war were built in the States, like the Hudsons and uh, Ventures, Baltimore's, and some of them were actually ordered by France before it had fallen to the Germans. And those planes, some of them were delivered as is uh, with metric, because the French were on metric. Yeah. Uh, and also, uh, uh, their throttle. Mm -hmm. They wanted to pull the lever back instead of uh, pushing it ahead, as we Amer Americans and English t type do. Mm -hmm. See, uh, one of the questions I was going to ask you was, uh, who brought all those planes back after the war was over, or were they left there? But then there wasn't a need to bring very many back. They brought uh, about eight squadrons. I think man, uh, Canadian in the uh, sixth group with the Canadians, we had about 14 bomber squadrons, I think, when the war ended. And I think eight of those squadrons were flown back to Canada and intended to go to the Pacific. But the Pacific War ended in uh, 9th of August or whatever it was, yeah. in 45. Yeah. So most of the planes are scrap. I see. You know, it's amazing how Britain was able to uh, build that many airplanes on such short notice, or relatively short notice, wasn't it? Yeah, there was, uh, I think the total in the Halifax was uh, 6,000 and something, and uh, Lancaster was 7,000 and something. That's a lot of airplanes. 
Uh, of course, the fighter planes were much more than that. Uh, the Wellington bomber was a twin-engine bomber, and it was a very successful bomber, too, in the early part of the war. Uh, it started off with, with engines a little bit over a thousand horsepower, and it ended up with engines of 1,600 horsepower. Uh, it was sturdy enough built, more than it needed when they had the, 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 when it first came out with a thousand pound or a thousand horsepower in it. So what uh, what uh, did they use for for um, fighter planes? Uh, they were used as uh, Spitfires, Hurricanes, uh, Typhoons. What was the Tiger Moth used for? Just as a training plane? Yeah. That's all. I think I think possibly there was other jobs early in the war. That transport and things like that. You know, that's where I first learned to fly was on a Tiger Moth. Mm -hmm. Then I progressed from there to, to an engine uh, Cessna cranes as often. Now, going back to the French underground, Vernon, uh, how much, uh, like what did your air crew consist of when you were doing those flights? What did our air your air crew? How many people were? Oh, the our had a seven-man crew. You did crew have a seven-man pilot, air bomber, navigator, the wireless op. Uh, we didn't have a mid-upper gunner because he was uh, trained as a dispatcher with uh, looking after the, the parcels that were being pushed out the hole in the bottom. So if someone attacked you, you couldn't. We had a tail gunner. Oh. Not only that, but we didn't need to worry too much about fighters. Why? Because we did our tour, or had to do our trips, trying to stay below radar. So we tried to fly at four or five hundred feet. Now that a fighter plane at night doesn't want to attack anybody that sat close to the ground, well, because he would possibly go on by and uh, and. and crash or whatever. Mm -hmm. So we were more worried about uh, even the small arms fire, machine guns and that, oh. when we crossed the coast. Mm -hmm. And of course, if you... And would they have been able to see you? No. The machine guns? Uh, they could have a good idea. If you well, they could this hear is, you. This is after, this is after dark, you know. Right. I, re I realize, <laughs> but like, you wouldn't, what about uh, your airplane lights? Would you have any oh, of those we on? Have, we were blacked out yeah. completely. Uh, possibly, if he was in the right direction, he might see uh, our reflection on the moon or on stars. Or, or they could hear you. Oh, yes, they definitely could hear us. Mm -hmm. uh, with you being blacked out like that and uh, other planes being blacked out like that, there'd be a reasonable risk of hitting one another, would, you, oh, would there, uh, at any time? De definitely, definitely. Yeah. Yep. Even seen it happen. <laughs> Is that right? Uh, yeah. When? Two big balls of fire. Where was this? Yeah. I say, where was this? Oh, this was in uh, the southeast part of England. Is that right? And were they uh, both, uh, were they enemy uh, planes or, or no, no. our own? Our own. Is that right? That's like getting hit by friendly fire, isn't it? Well, yes. But, I don't know, uh, they found out that the safest way to, for Bomber Command to uh, make a trip to Berlin was to try and keep your planes within a 30 mile across and 10 miles long or whatever. Mm -hmm. It overloaded the radar down below and the anti-aircraft guns. If you could fly 800 planes in less than 30 minutes, 800 planes, that's yeah, a lot. Yeah, in 30 minutes. That's a lot of tra light air traffic. 
So there was lots. There was more than than just running into your own planes. You had the enemy f fighters up there looking for you, and they didn't have too far hard, hard to look. You must have often felt like a, a shooting duck. Well, I guess they did, but I I I didn't have any firsthand experience at it because I was on special duties and we were doing hours of now, 500 were, feet. Were you ever shot at? Pardon? Did you ever have anyone shooting at oh, you? Oh, yes. You did. Uh, that was uh, on my very first trip. And it was what they call the second dicky trip. The pilot and the air bomber and the navigator for their first would fly with an experienced crew to get one trip in. And you didn't actually have to do anything, but you could look out and see the, the sights and know what you were going to be doing possibly the very next night. Mm -hmm. And the crew that I was did my second dicky trip was, I guess, uh, not up to par. They got badly lost and they flew over this town and then, I don't know, maybe a small city. And of course, they all, the anti-aircraft fire opened up, but most of it was because we were so low, it was, wasn't that serious, at least the very first time I thought it was. Mm -hmm. If it had been after I'd been ha doing 15 or 20 trips, possibly I'd have thought that that was, it was common. To it was be. normal. <laughs> it was normal. Wow. The very first trip is pretty big. Well, I'm sure with the very first trip, you were certainly glad to see the home runway come up. That's <laughs> for sure. And you just hope that when the Padre give you that there cup of, of coffee that there was a spike in it. <laughs> was there? Sometimes. Mm -hmm. If you, uh, later on when you got the shakes. Uh, there was, I would uh, think. Yeah. It would help several, calm several, your nerves. Several of them, people, no detriment to them really, but uh, their, their temperament or whatever, as some of them could take it better than others. Well, it's like that in, in life. Yeah. You know, whether there's a war, honor, and peace, some yeah. people can handle stress better than others. Yeah. So that's just the way it is, and goodness knows there was lots yeah. of stress there. And they were often, you know, get derogatory, maybe is the word, remarks about being uh, yellow bellies or whatever the official expression was LMF, lack of moral fiber. But yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, going back to uh, the French underground, uh, can you tell us more about that? Because we haven't dealt with all your experiences with the French underground, Vernon. Uh, I don't know just where to start, really, but uh, we would be interrogated before we left, or briefed, as they called it, mm -hmm. about certain farmers' field, and these had to be uh, close to uh, possibly a creek, or s because these people down below that were getting these parcels had to be very quick to. Uh, take them uh, into the nearest bush and uh, discard the parachutes and respond what, as quickly as they and could. Be, and uh, they were sitting ducks if an uh, enemy plane came over. You would see these white, uh, we call them, you, know, when you hit the silk, or, but it wasn't yeah. actually silk, it was more like a rayon. They, yeah. they said there was areas in, uh, in France where all the women's underwear was uh, made out of parachutes. Uh, uh, Is that uh, right? That came down with these. Well, that was nylon, wasn't it? That those parachutes. No, I don't know what. I think it was a kind of nylon. You could call it nylon or not, but uh, I think that was why we couldn't get nylon uh, well, hosiery over here. Possibly. Because you fellows were using it in your parachutes. <laughs> I thought that uh, it was more of a. Um, oh, what's the different ladies? Well, uh, Rayon. Rayon, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because I thought even our uh, long johns were had a portion of something like that in. Is that the, right? Uh, especially ones that were fireproof. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these uh, 
people that we receive are would have to get uh, uh, away with uh, and these here parcels these here parcels that we dropped out of the bomb bay uh, as I said there was about the size of a hot water tank or whatever and about eight feet long they would normally have uh, two uh, handles on it each side for four men to grab that and pick it up and run with it mm -hmm. to get it into the closest bush or tangle. They like creeks really. I guess uh, brambles and stuff and that that they could hide the stuff quite quickly. Mm -hmm. I think that has been referred to as silk too for the parachutes. Yeah. Hasn't it? Um, but some yeah, that I have silk. seen. You hit the silk is yeah. when you parachute mm -hmm. out. Yeah. But uh, uh, some that I have seen were, um, uh, I think, but, mainly uh, Some of these places where we would drop these uh, parcels in that were possibly visited by one of our planes a few weeks before when we would have a, a Joe, as we call them, somebody that would go down to organize uh, the people. And would that be a French person or was it a British person? Or a Canadian, uh, or what? Uh, well, there could be, but we were instructed to never talk to them in anything but French oh, when that they right? went to come on to get on the plane. Uh, it was very hush hush at, at, at home. The uh, blacked out car, I don't know what they call it, a Mariah, would approach your plane just a few minutes before takeoff. We have of course, we were notified earlier that we were going to take some Joes, and they would come and unload uh, three or four, and as many as we had, as many as seven. To uh, drop off. That we were going to drop off over. And would you be dropping off equipment as well? Yeah. Would. But usually we try to drop the, f the equipment in the next field to the ones where the people went down. Oh, I we see because they had very little with them. Mm -hmm. I guess they'd have their razors and whatever, or, uh, some of their change of clothes or whatever, but they went down with very little. But we weren't to talk to them in anything but French. Even before they, like when they'd get on the plane, yeah. was that the same? Yeah, yeah. we couldn't. <coughs> and I, of course, without any, any French, I was not handicapped that way. Mm -hmm. But my pilot had quite a bit of French, and he could talk to them. I got into a bit of an argument with, with my crew because I had shouted at one mm -hmm. of them. Uh, they're under such stress. We have the, the same thing maybe happen. Uh, uh, you're intoxicated without ever drinking a drink mm -hmm. with, with stress or, or whatever, mm -hmm. and this chap, he, he jumped out of the plane and he had a cigarette in his mouth and he went around to kick the tires and that on the plane with a cigarette and f gasoline fumes coming down. I yelled and I said, poof! <laughs> <laughs> My crew bawled me out for being so <laughs> abrupt. I don't know, I don't blame <laughs> you. <laughs> That's pretty explosive. Yeah. So you would drop them off then and never see them again? No. Did you ever uh, have any way of finding out if they were safe after they got there? Or oh, yes, we heard here. You would? Uh, about two weeks later, we would go into the intelligence office on underground at the honor station where everything was very hush hush and you had to be verified or whatever by your flight commander and whatever. And we would get a report about how they had mm -hmm. accomplished and what they had done. Well, that, that would be gratifying, wouldn't it? Oh, yes, definitely. We would look forward to going and seeing mm -hmm. like how they would send a, a flowing, uh, beautiful uh, summary of what we had done. Mm -hmm. and Is that we right? Didn't, we didn't know that we hadn't done anything that was out of the ordinary. They were so appreciative of what we had done for them. It sounds pretty it extraordinary to me, Vernon. Yeah. Uh, no, it, uh, it was and really it must exciting, exciting work. Uh, and when uh, it must be exciting for you to look back on that period of your life, is it not? 
It is, but who do you talk to about it? You have so few uh, air crew in yeah. your area. Yeah, that, that you can discuss it with. Yeah. People that really understand. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's just the same with, with casualties. Now, we would lose up to 10% of our planes, not us, mm -hmm. but Bomber Command in general. We lose up to 10% to of her, your planes on any one raid. Uh, you'd possibly lose 40 or 50 planes if you had 500 going out. And uh, there would be uh, approximately 350 air crew that you wouldn't see again. Now, if you have a casualty of four or five people, they figure it's so terrible, and yet we live with it every day that we weren't sure that uh, we would ever see home again. I'm sure. And I uh, heard or read just recently about, um, uh, with the Air Force, uh, them counting the flights coming back in and sometimes there would maybe be only one out of a group of five planes or whatever that would return that's those are pretty high losses yeah and it, must it was wartime it was wartime but it must have been pretty uh, scary uh, when those planes didn't return Takes a few bottles to forget it and be able to get to sleep. I would think, yeah. And those, a lot of those people would be very close to you. Not Were really. They? You didn't want to get close to people because you. Oh, is that right? Because it seems to me. You, in you, 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 you were afraid you were going to lose them. I see. I always had the idea with the army that they became very close. Well, yes, uh, the Army, I think, it's was a, a lot. It's a different environment, though, isn't it? Uh, possibly, too. Uh, with the Army, a lot of them were in the same platoon or whatever from the time they joined up until they were... Where's Discharged, almost. Uh, I would lose every time I was posted to this or that. I would have to become friends with a new bunch. The new crew. Like part of my training, when I went to McDonald's on uh, tarmac duty, uh, I was the only one from Gladstone. There was two from Langworth, George Hannison and Hardy Olson. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Six months later, we were going all together different places, taking different courses. Mm -hmm. So you didn't get to know anyone. You were more scattered all the time, being but, scattered. But your seven-man crew that flew all those trips together, they were just like brothers to you. I would think. And so you always had that same crew when you were doing these flights uh, over there? Mo most of the time, there was an odd time. I was yoked a couple of times to fly with another crew because somebody was sick or whatever in another crew, and our crew wasn't due to do. Because I have flown three nights in a row, but it's terrible. I would think. It would take you a few nights after that just to be able to get back to sleep, wouldn't you, it? You'd go to sleep at 8 o'clock in the morning when you finished your off breakfast. You would sleep until 6, get up and, and have a meal and go back and you'd sleep until noon the next day exactly. if nobody woke you. Well. You could sleep for 36 hours. Yeah. But it was to get to sleep the first time. I would think yeah. Uh, that's what I would think it would be the first time that it would be very difficult. Yeah. And uh, so uh, these flights that you did with the French underground, uh, 
when you were finished doing those, what did you do after that? F finished dropping our load? Mm -hmm. Quite often I would take over and fly the plane back. No, but I mean when your tour of flights was over, then what took place? Like after you completed your tours? After we completed the trip? Yep. To we all the, your, your tour, you know, of a number of trips. You mean after the tour was fin yep. finished? Mm -hmm. uh, we were supposed to be posted to uh, uh, a training squadron and uh, we would be on training other crews for possibly six months to nine months before they would and you'd let be you go back on another tour. And you'd be instructing? Yeah. How did you like that? I didn't. Did you not? No. Why? The war was going to be over. Even the students that you were trying to instill different knew that uh, that possibility of them ever getting through all the different courses and everything, the war in Europe would be over. So you didn't have that as enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. Because when I finished my tour in, uh, in August of 44, I was supposed to be off for nine months. Well, you had nine months on to, uh, yeah. August of 44, and even the Japanese had, had mm -hmm. packed it in. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I, I asked for, and I was given an early discharge. Oh, is that right? February of uh, 45, and the war in Europe didn't end until May. So well, I asked for an early discharge. And they kept a string on me, though, if they ever needed me. And uh, they kept you in uh, England? Pardon? Wait, did you remain in England? Yeah, I remained in England until uh, for several months, and then I came back to Canada. At what time? I was time? in Canada for a little while before I was discharged. But uh, When did you come back to Canada? Um, in November of 44. Oh, did you? I so had been finished my tour for three months. What? What uh, were you doing when the war ended? Where when the war you? ended, I was cleaning grain because I'd had this early discharge and I was going to be putting in a crop in 45. I see. <laughs> <laughs> so when they told me, they came and told me that uh, the, the war was over, they'd heard it on the radio, I didn't. I don't think I cleaned much more grain that day, I think, so I celebrated. So, and what were you doing on D-Day? D-Day? Mm -hmm. The 6th of June. We were flying in, um, oh, what was the word? We were taking scarecrows up Which the coast from where the invasion was going to take place. What what were, were scarecrows? The dummy parachutists. And uh, we were on a very strict timetable. It had to be a half a minute apart. And we crossed the coast and then turned parallel of the coast and flew 60 or 70 miles and then did a slow turn and went back the same course and out and across the channel. And these scarecrows were uh, dummy parachutes that were, uh, well, you see the same thing in the park on uh, Dominion Day. Mm -hmm. All these fireworks that would be going off and machine gun fire and it was to, it, uh, Hitler thought that Definitely, where uh, the invasion would come in the shortest place across the channel, and we wanted to keep on thinking that until the invasion was well underway, uh, 200 miles farther down the coast. Mm -hmm. So when we went to bed at, at just at daylight. Uh, there was a big roar in uh, uh, our barracks and that, that, that the invasion has taken place. Mm -hmm. 
we said we knew that five or six hours before. Is that right? Because we could see all these ships going across the channel when we were over there, went over there to drop these scarecrows. Now the weather wasn't really that good that day, was it? No, no. So how would it have been for flying? Uh, it, it didn't bother us that much. Mm -hmm. uh, another question that comes to mind is, uh, did you see anything of uh, Europe when you were flying, or was it that you were flying mostly at day or at uh, night time, so that you wouldn't see too much of the countryside? No, we didn't see too much of the countryside. I did make one trip to, uh, as after the war, as, uh, our tour was over, we took a radar unit into Brussels just after the army had passed through. Mm -hmm. So I actually landed on European soil mm -hmm. for a couple of hours. And one other trip, we had to make a trip down into, very far down into the French Alps in July, and there wasn't enough darkness to get back home, so we flew across the Mediterranean and landed in uh, Air Force Station that was about 49 kilometers, they said. That was, they were, in, 49 they used um, kilometers when from we where? used, pardon? 49 kilometers from, from Algiers. Oh, is that right? Yeah. And uh, this station had been French before the war had started. Uh, Germans and Italians had used it while the war was on until they were kicked out of North Africa. Mm -hmm. And this station had uh, most of the personnel for cooking and that were Italian prisoners of war. Mm -hmm. And of course, when they found out that we were Canadians, because we had breakfast there, they wanted to know if anybody was from Toronto. They come to me first, and I said, Manitoba. But when my pilot said he was from Toronto, oh, they wanted to oh, tell him that he knows such and such a person. <laughs> of course, with the population of Toronto, was he likely to know the, his cousin that was in Toronto, <laughs> Canada? Right. So, um, now, um, how did you feel when it was time to return home? Did you feel good about this? No, yeah, but I Are dreaded you? what might become because of the stories my father would tell me about the, uh, the hard times that came after the First World War when the prices were shot up and then all at once they blew up. And but what about uh, the emotional drain when you got back? Well, it was hard to settle down. I would think. Yeah. I would think. And perhaps even harder because the fighting wasn't over there yet. Yeah. And what about the rest of your crew? Did they take an early leave too or no? No, no. Uh, well, the one uh, stayed in, he was, got his commission, got his, to be an officer, and he went back uh, sometime during the year that the war was over and took up his job that he had before the war at, uh, in Kimberley, in the mines at Kimberley, B.C. Mm -hmm. The pilot, of course, what was he to do? He'd come right straight from grade 12 high school right into the Air Force, so he didn't have a, an occupation before the war. Mm -hmm. He got a government job. He'd like to get a good one. Oh, yes. Uh, I understood that he was an uh, inspector for distillery, uh, Gilby's. Uh, oh, that would be a good one. <laughs> yeah. I think he possibly could, uh, sampled quite a few of them. Now, were there many that uh, had uh, of the pilots that returned and into the uh, uh, flying commercial flights in Canada? When they come back, well, some of them did. It was there were a dime a dozen. There was just hundreds of them that were already trained and everything. And mm -hmm. Like even in our own our own crew, my tail gunner, he was insisting that we fly in uh, one of these fishing camps in uh, 
northern Alberta and BC. Okay. He thought that I could do the flying and uh, he could run the camp. Mm -hmm. Speaking of the tail gunner, I read once a number of years ago that uh, they were in the most uh, uh, scariest position. They were the, one, the easiest target. Yeah, easiest well, to get injured. Actually, if you, got to, if you were attacking a, a, a plane, you'd get the tail gunner and then you could take the rest of the plane by your convenience. So there was a lot of <coughs> responsibility on the tail gunner. That's right. But there was an odd case where the tail gunner was the only one that survived. Is that right? The plane, if it made a forced landing and broke up, quite often the tail gunner was the one that would survive. Hmm. In his turret, he was strapped in, and it was, uh, you didn't have to have any of these signs along the highway where you to use your seat belt. Uh, they automatically used their seat belts. It must, it must have been a claustrophobic position, was it not? It was. I've flown, uh, not on a, on a real op, I've flown, on, and uh, I didn't like it at all. I don't think I could have even. I never even liked uh, sitting on in a train uh, with my back to the direction that we were going. Mm -hmm. I always wanted to be uh, facing forward. Yeah. Whereas the tail gunner, he was, he, he seen what we had already seen. He was always <laughs> sitting backwards. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> no, I would think that it was very difficult. Now, you, it was it because you received a very prestigious award, the Distinguished Flying Cross, mm. right? Yeah. Now, was this because of your uh, association with the French Underground, or what was this? Uh, it was from, for. mostly for the quality of our work. Was it? Uh, also, we had actually finished a tour. Mm -hmm. When you start one of these t tours, uh, the percentage of the people that started it and then finished it is uh, scary. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, for every hundred, that started a tour, it was very unusual to have more than 25 to finish a tour. That's, that's amazing. But when they quote uh, casualties, they quote the casualties of the entire RCAF or whatever, mm -hmm. whereas you have uh, 10 times as many people that are non-air crew as air crew. So if you take the percentage of people that were, were air crew and how many casualties you have, it is scary. Uh, very scary. Now, I hope our cameraman can uh, pick up your medal that you received for the Distinguished Flying Cross that you're wearing there, and it, and it has the most prominent position on your medals. And what are the other medals for, Vernon? Uh, the Distinguished Flying Cross is a decoration, it's not a medal. Oh, is that right? These others are campaign medal, medals, as they call them. Mm -hmm. If you served, automatically everybody got it. Mm -hmm. Now, I can't see, but I think the next one to the Distinguished Flying Cross, the very first one, would be the red and two shades of blue. Mm -hmm. That was the 39, well, it was for a while it was 39, 43 star, but they changed it to 45 star. Mm -hmm. um, possibly the next one is my uh, Air Crew Europe. Mm -hmm. And it should have a bar on it. Yes, it does. Uh, you're entitled to wear two of the three, the 3945 star, the air crew Europe star, or the France Germany star. There wasn't too many that actually would have been wearing the, the full thing anyway, mm -hmm. but you could wear two of the three, mm -hmm. and you wore a little bar to, 
show that you were entitled to the third one. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. uh, and can't even see. Well, that's okay. One has uh, orange and green on it, and uh, one would be for having served overseas, I would think. The uh, one with a little maple, me metal maple leaf mm -hmm. is uh, a volunteer service medal, and it's the one that uh, people in or service people in Europe felt that uh, every Canadian's got one. Is that right? Because uh, you you didn't go overseas unless you were a volunteer. No, no. Well, I did hear once that some of them that right, didn't volunteer right were the, sent. Yeah, right at the tail end of the war, yeah. some of the zombies were sent over. Yeah. yeah. But uh, it. Uh, but the other ones look more familiar to me. But the two at the front and your distinguished flying cross are new to me, not familiar to me. Yeah. Now, when were you awarded that? Uh, I was actually on the boat on the way home when it came over. They were asking for a pilot officer, Watson. And of course, uh, being Watson, I figured it was a dirty job that there was. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's, that's, uh, <laughs> If I could have do it over again, I'd have stroked that there doubly off in my... <laughs> You'd have gone as Otson. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what did you do? Did you did you answer? No, I didn't answer. You didn't? I, well, I was already... Uh, we landed in New York in the evening and uh, traveled overnight to uh, uh, Ottawa. Mackenzie King was supposed to greet us, but... Uh, he didn't bother. The crew that had came back a little while before us, he got booed. So he I was going to say, a lot of you guys weren't that fond of Mackenzie King anyway. <laughs> That's for sure. So it wasn't until I got to Winnipeg, and they wanted to know about my distinguished flying cross. And I said, oh, I didn't get one of those. They said, well, it's right in the daily paper. So would your family have known about this before you got home? Yes, uh, my family had. Uh, oh, and there's, that, this is uh, yeah. uh, the yeah. letter there yeah. about it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And our camera will pick that up so that our viewers can see it. And the other is a picture of you when you were strapping young new. New pilot new, officer. New pilot officer. That's quite some time ago. Yeah. Now, you started out as an LAC. No, an AC-2. Oh, an AC-2. Yeah. Oh, I see. Uh, and... Uh, when I finished my ITS course, I was given an LAC, and I was an LAC all through my other training until I got my wing. I see. And I got my wing. I also got a commission. Now, what about the women? How did they start out? Uh, I don't know what were they... Were they AW2s or something? Well, they were... LAWs was a leading air woman. Right. And what but, would, uh, what would there their... There would be an, uh, one or two below that, I believe. Then, of course, uh, being that they weren't allowed in the air crew, the uh, ranks would be quite... Uh, Close together, they'd have to be, uh, after an LEC, they'd have to be a corporal or mm -hmm. then a f flight. What would an LAW have uh, to do? Would they have a certain uh, That would be do? after they had uh, passed their first course, whatever mm -hmm. it was. It possibly, so it uh, would depend on what? Dietary course, if they were going to be a cook. and. Uh, a lot of them were involved with photography too, weren't they? That's right, and there was an awful lot of them were involved in the parachute section. Mm -hmm. Like these parachutes that we used had to be uh, dried out. They had a tall thing that they would uh, open up the parachute and hang it, and then it would get uh, air dry before mm -hmm. it was repacked again. Mm -hmm. 
because it's got too much dampness in it that it would freeze mm -hmm. when you're flying at 20,000 feet or whatever. So they were used as parachute packers. Uh, clothing stores, they give out clothing. Although yeah. usually the, uh, there'd be a man in charge of several of them. And didn't some of them have to chart the flights that were oh, in yes. progress? Oh, uh, yes. This is overseas, yeah. Mm -hmm. They'd have to. And they worked the radar a lot of, mm -hmm. a lot of cases. They were transport drivers, were mostly on our station, oh, where right? we got to know know them. I usually got to know them by name, mm -hmm. because the same. They'd have these here. I guess you call them quarter ton trucks, with canvas over the back, and you could pile a whole crew, seven man crew, in the back. And they take you out to your plane because they were dispersal, and were, mm -hmm. sometimes you had a mile and a half to go from your flight to out to the plane. Is that right? So, uh, but uh, go back to my DFC, if I may. Certainly. Uh, being that I wasn't being able to present, being presented by King George himself, uh, they were going to do it with uh, in Canada. The ones that had got back to Canada before, uh, they were usually going to be the Governor General mm -hmm. was going to present them sometime. So I was notified, and I don't know just what year it was, uh, that I was supposed to go to a presentation at, at uh, Saskatoon. It was addressed to uh, Plumas, Saskatchewan. Uh, my wife even bought a, a business suit because we didn't know what kind of uh, clothing that uh, the wives were expected to wear. We were expected to wear our uniform. Right. That we are. Your Air so, Force uniform. Yeah, and uh, it got down to, uh, I hadn't got my ticket yet, and they discovered that uh, Plumas wasn't in Saskatchewan. <laughs> so they canceled it. Well, then the next year, it was supposed to be in uh, legislative buildings in, in Winnipeg, and by this time, uh, Governor General Alexander was our Governor General. He'd been a big wheel in the, of chasing the, the Italians and the Germans out of North Africa. Oh, yes. And he had got a, his lordship, or whatever you call it. He was going to present it, and it was supposed to be the first week in May in 1950. And if you're familiar with the history of Winnipeg in yes. May in 1950, <laughs> we had the flood. That's right. <laughs> so it was canceled again. Well, then about six months later, it was sent to me by uh, registered mail. Is that right? So I didn't get to have it pinned on by George or, uh, or even the Governor General of Canada. Well, you know, you should have maybe answered that call you got when you were on board the boat. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe you would have been yeah. given it then. Yeah. So w what do you think uh, of the, uh, what's been happening with our sea kings in today's, the, what's happened over we, the last few years? We have lost servicemen as MPs. For quite a few years after the war, uh, possibly uh, 20 or 30 percent well. of the MPs were, had been servicemen during the war. Mm -hmm. Now, all the MPs have never served. Well, things have been thinner ever since George Hees That's right. left. Like there's yeah. been a, a weaker voice. Uh, and even uh, as much as ridicule as Diefenbaker got, he was a veteran of the First World War. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that it's been an awful mistake the way that they've let the services deteriorate so much in the last 20 years. They really have. It and wouldn't have mattered uh, if uh, 
Canada had offered to join the United States in the present displeasure, but uh, where would they have found the men to have sent them? And the equipment for them. Yeah. When you got a, a Sea King helicopter that should have been replaced 20 years ago, start off on a trip to the Persian Gulf, and three days out from Halifax, it's scrap heap it in. It's, it's terrible to think that our government would, at least in my opinion, that our government would expect men to get up in those units. Yeah. It's pretty sad. But because they were uh, never a serviceman. Mm -hmm. they, they didn't realize or didn't yeah. wish to. Yeah. And what do you, looking back on it all, what do you uh, feel was the scariest moment you had? Possibly the first time I was shot at. Wondered if I was going to be able to get back home. Is that right? Did they hit the plane at all? No. They didn't? No. no, it was on my second Dickey trip and I was with a crew that I was to get experience with. So that was an early. I was never was so early. disappointed in anything in my life. They were just screaming at one another. Who was screaming at one another? The, the crew that I was doing my second Dickey trip with. Oh, they were? I thought if that's all that it's, we've got to look forward to, that I didn't know how things were going to go, but it was unfortunate that I was sent on a crew that were good proportion, I think, were, but you couldn't prove, or LMF. Well, so they basically panicked. Yes, and they, you couldn't hardly get them off the ground. They'd be scheduled to make a trip and if there wasn't somebody that would get sick at the last moment so that they have to cancel a trip they'd find something wrong with one motor or another mm -hmm. I was actually s supposed to fly them once with them after I made 10 or 12 trips and I didn't you like declined. the idea you declined yeah don't blame you <laughs> yeah. no no, uh, that, it must be very, well, I think that uh, uh, that sort of a task would require commonness to succeed. Uh, I think that, you know, the higher-ups should have realized what was wrong with that crew because they had been on our station for four or five months before I had arrived on our station. They still hadn't done a half a tour yet when I was finished. They should have realized that there was something wrong. Well, with it. you would think the evidence they, they, would indicate it. Yeah. What were some of your, you know, we've had some, uh, a lot of publicity, publicity about flying aces, and what did you feel about some of our flying aces, and who were your heroes? Or is heroes the right word to use? I suppose Guy Gibson would be one. Mm -hmm. um, Pritchard would be another. Guy Gibson was the one that that flew the dam buster squadron that bombed uh, those dams on the uh, German rivers that produced the electricity. Mm -hmm. He was granted the VSC for that. What's he? Yeah. Did I say VFC? The VC. Yeah, you, I think you said the VC. Mm -hmm. And that's the Victoria Cross. Yeah. Uh, Pritchard was one that, that developed a lot of different techniques to make the trips more efficient. And was he Canadian? No. Oh, no. RAF? Yeah. And of course, there's uh, Doug Bader, the yes. legless wonder. Mm -hmm. 
Can you tell about him? Pardon? Can you tell more about him? Well, he had uh, joined up in the late 20s or early 30s, and not too long before the war, he had a very bad accident with a plane crash, and uh, I don't know whether he lost both legs in that crash or he lost them one afterwards, but when war was declared, he was insistent that he could still fly, even without legs. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they gave him artificial legs, really, and he actually commanded one of the, the first Canadian squadrons, was exactly. made up mostly of new Canadians and uh, Polish flyers that had escaped from Poland. Did you have many of those? Uh, on our squadron even, we had uh, several that were there just before I arrived. At the, mm -hmm. They come back to, for visits and they had find, flown uh, some of the trips to Poland that were 14 and 15 hours long dropping supplies to the underground in Poland. My understanding mm -hmm. is the Polish people were very brave. Almost a, to the point of being foolhardy. Is that right? It was much the same. We had, uh, I was trained with uh, some of the people that, or men that escaped from uh, Holland. Mm -hmm. And they were desperate to go back there and make amends or uh, pay somebody back for what they had gone through. Not realizing they'd be doing it single-handedly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Were there any others that come to mind that you... No, not, not really. Mm -hmm. We had quite a few uh, Americans at one time with us, but uh, by the time war was getting near end, mm -hmm. they, of course, were stood out like a, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, a sore thumb or whatever. With so much security in our business, uh, a khaki uniform stood out and possibly would be questioned or whatever. We did have a few uh, South Africans, and the South Africans wore with the khaki uniform too. Oh, is they, that right? They kept the, the South Africans had kept the army ranks. Mm -hmm. And on our squadron, we had three Norwegian pilots that had escaped by fishing boat from from uh, Norway and had joined the RAF. Is that right? And were they good and pilots? They were, they were even permitted on their dress uniform. They could wear their Norwegian insignia. But on their battle dress uniform, or the uniform that they wore down to the flights all the yeah. time, they uh, carried their uh, Canadian rank and Well, wing. that makes sense, though, doesn't it? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. it makes sense. Um, now, a while ago, we were talking about um, Buzz Bierling. Are you familiar with his career? Uh, some of it. Uh, he served and he was well received in Malta when he was on the island down in the Mediterranean. Uh, he was supposed to have had wonderful eyesight and wonderful judgment. I imagine that uh, any time he went out to a goose pit or a duck blind that uh, he was pretty sharp on shooting something on the fly. And that, of course, carried over to his attacking of shooting down planes. Mm -hmm. It seems to me, in reading about a number of the um, flying aces that I've read about, that a lot of them were, well, they were certainly keen marksmen. Oh, 